Hello guys, we're starting a new series on the show today. We're going to talk about general anti-Hindu and anti-India bias in academia, either in India or abroad. And I'm going to talk about certain prominent academics that are leading this charge against Hindus in India. And today's topic is going to be about Sheldon Pollock. My name is Sham Sharma. Welcome to the Sham Sharma Show. Hello, hello, and welcome. Welcome to another edition of the Sham Sharma Show. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks very much for joining me. I appreciate you. Are you new to the show? If you are, and if you enjoyed today's episode, please make sure to subscribe to the show's channel if you do enjoy it. And if you have watched me before, if you have watched what we do here on the show before, and if you haven't subscribed already, please make sure to subscribe. All right, so have you noticed that in the West, universities have increasingly become hotbeds for social justice warriors, for this postmodernist propaganda, where free speech is curbed, where everything is racist and intersectionality is the only thing that matters. And a lot of you must be wondering, well, why has this happened? Why has this suddenly happened in universities? Why? 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 Well, it's not a sudden movement, let me tell you. What has happened is that the West has for a very long time funded these universities to go and deconstruct and go and break and weaken civilizations overseas, particularly India. And now that virus that the West has propagated in India has now come to bite them in the ass. So for a long time, through government approval and through government encouragement, these universities have done research into India and into Hindu studies and Hindu philosophy in an attempt to weaken Hindu culture and in an attempt to break apart Hindu culture by painting it as some sort of an evil, dictatorial, fascist ideology. And again, I'm not saying that I agree with anything that's happening in the universities in the West right now, but I'm just saying that there's a precedent for it. And you know how people talk about how the left and the right have moved so further apart in the West that there's literally almost no reconciliation between them. But let me tell you about an area where they actually harmoniously come together. They both want to weaken India, but for two very different reasons. The right in the West wants to weaken India because it sees India as the last frontier for the Abrahamic religions. It's the one area where the Abrahamic religions have not been able to conquer it. Look at all other ancient civilizations. Look at Greece, dead. Look at Egypt, dead. Look at South America, dead. So they see India as this final frontier that they need to conquer and all these sweet, sweet souls that they need to save and harvest. The left is coming at it from the ideology that Hinduism is an evil ideology. Hinduism is a fascist ideology and Hinduism, because it is a fascist ideology, it is built towards one group of people subduing another group of people and that is why it must be destroyed. And one of the proponents of this ideology in India is the gentleman that I'm going to be talking about today, Mr. Sheldon Pollock. So Sheldon Pollock is a professor at Columbia University and to give fair credit to him, he is a very very well read man. He is a very well versed man in Indian philosophy. But this is a man who holds a lot of contempt for Indian philosophy. And this is a man that has often approached Indian philosophy and Indian metaphysics from his own communist point of view. Whereas he sees Hindu philosophy as this some sort of an oppressive philosophy. Because this is a man that approaches Hindu philosophy with this thing called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs or theories. Now what, what he does is as he already has this notion in his head that India is this oppressive society. So whatever he studies, he applies that same state of mind and that same philosophy to whatever he studies so then he projects that philosophy to everything Hindu related that he studies and remember this is the man that has been awarded the Indian President's Award for Sanskrit this is a man that has been awarded the Padma Shri which is the highest civilian honor in India he has been featured as one of the star speakers and one of the star attractions at the Jaipur Literary Festival for years and he's also present at many other high-level seminars and fests in India to tell Indians about how oppressive their culture is so like I say sometimes Hindus don't even need foreigners to destroy themselves. We're enough to destroy ourselves. And one of the big reasons why Mr. Shelton Pollock was in the news recently was in 2016, Narayan Murthy, who was the founder of Infosys, he announced the decision to create a Murthy Classical Library of India, which is a landmark project which is looking to translate 500 traditional classical Indian works of literature into English. Again, that is a fantastic move. 
and I really think some Indian scholars can really benefit from this funding and can really benefit from the exposure that the Murti Classical Library of India will provide to these Indian scholars. Wait, this funding went to Indian scholars and an Indian university, right? <laughs> nope. That's right. This funding actually went to Harvard University, and guess who was chosen to head the Murti Classical Library of India? Yes. And there was actually a petition signed by thousands of people and hundreds of scholars and intellectuals that was asking Rohan Murthy, who is the son of Narayan Murthy, to reconsider his decision to appoint Pollock as the head of the Classical Library of India. But of course, that fell on deaf ears and Mr. Sheldon Pollock is still the head of the Murthy Classical Library of India. So this is why, because of our self-destructive tendencies, this is why it is so important for us to wake up. It is so important for us to organize better and it is so important for us to know more about these intellectuals and these scholars who are studying India. So Sheldon Pollock essentially echoes the same views of Max Miller and Macaulay where he talks about the Shastras actually serve no real purpose and the Vedas actually show, serve no real purpose than just a way in which Indians express themselves. There's no spiritual purpose to it at all. Not only do they serve no purpose, but they're also responsible for blocking and stopping the spread of critical thinking and the spread of free thought in India and Hindu society. And to say that he has a clear political agenda is to state the matter exactly how it is. He's very clear to remove the sacredness of Sanskrit and he's very adamant to view Sanskrit from a very political lens. And he does this because he knows that Sanskrit has links to every single state, every single language and every single community in India. Sanskrit has a truly pan-Indian influence which is why he wants to destroy and deconstruct Sanskrit. And he talks about how Sanskrit was used as a political tool to oppress women and to oppress Shudras and to oppress different kinds of minorities. And then he also makes the giant leap of saying that the Nazis were actually influenced by Sanskrit. He says that the way Brahmins use Sanskrit to oppress women and oppress minorities and oppress Dalits, Nazis actually got inspired by this and developed their own theories of race and their own theories of racial superiority. This is a man that is an open proponent of the Aryan invasion theory. The Aryan invasion theory which has been widely debunked throughout the world, but people still do not hesitate to propagate it. And he uses this Aryan invasion theory to link Sanskrit with the Nazi movement. And remember, this is the guy that won the Padma Shri. And there's a great book that has been written about Sheldon Pollock by Mr. Rajiv Malhotra. And the book is called The Battle for Sanskrit. And it is, it is a great book and it deconstructs every single one of Sheldon Pollock's arguments really, really brilliantly. And I cannot recommend that book highly enough. So I would really recommend that you go check it out when you can. And in the book, it mentions that one of his biggest contributions, one of Sheldon Pollock's biggest contributions is that he claims that Sanskrit, after it is written down, goes through a phase of literarization. This is when Sanskrit gets endowed with certain structures that make it an elite language of power over the masses. And then of course he links the Vedas as being the source of this power and of these oppressive structures. Another case of his twisted political interpretation of Indian texts and Indian epics is this thing that Sheldon Pollock calls political philology, where he talks about Valmiki's Ramayana. And he says that everything good about Valmiki's Ramayana actually comes from Buddhism. So he actually claims that Buddha was born before Valmiki, which is not true at all. And this is a very popular movement in America and particularly in the West, that they use a lot of elements of Hindu philosophy that they really admire and they attribute almost everything to Buddhism. I've seen a lot of people that I admire, including Sam Harris, talk about concepts that clearly belong to Hinduism and that were clearly originated in Hindu philosophy and attributed to Buddhism. So Sheldon Pollock talks about the Ramayana and he says that it is a trick by Brahmins and monarchs to justify royal power, priestly authority and caste apostles. Moreover, in justifying a war against Ravan, the Ramayana essentially declares war on all outsiders, particularly the Muslims, though these invaders only were to arrive a thousand years late. Again, remember. And here's the thing, if that is what you take away from the Ramayana, then you obviously do not understand the Ramayana because what he conveniently fails to mention is that Ravan was a Brahman. In Ramayana, Ravan is painted as a great king, as a very, very well-read man, very knowledgeable man, very accomplished man, and a great warrior, a warrior so great that even the gods were afraid of him. But despite all of these attributes, his actions 
are what leads to his downfall. His actions are what make him an evil and a wicked man. So the lesson to be learned here from the Ramayana is that no matter how great you are, no matter what you have achieved in life, and no matter what your birth is, if you do bad things, you will still be a bad person and you will still get your karma. And Paul conveniently fails to recognize this because that would take away from the theory that he propagates that Brahmins have always been painted as these wonderful people in Indian literature. And there's absolutely no point in here about declaring a war on outsiders because again, like I said, Ravan was a Brahmin. He was not an outsider by any means. And again, what also consolidates the fact that he has a particular political inclination from which he is studying Hindu philosophy and Hindu literature is because he not only studies and tries to deconstruct these Indian literature, but he's also very politically involved in different processes in India. He has been a prominent signatory of several statements which are of a polit purely political nature and devoid of any academic merit. Those statements have condemned various policies and actions of the government of India. He has shown utter indifference and disrespect for democratic values and even the international norms of non-interference in the internal functioning of constitutional representative institutions in other countries. In addition, he expressed strong support for the students who were chanting in JNU that Bharat tere tukde honge, inshallah, inshallah, allegedly, and that Chin ke lenge azadi, and that they were sloganeering and that they were shouting that the Supreme Court was responsible for the extrajudicial killing of an innocent person. Who is that innocent person, you might ask? Afzal Guru, a convicted terrorist responsible for the attack on the Indian parliament. So he's very keen to petition in India for, you know, the oppressive policies of India. But we have never seen Sheryl Pollock ever raise his voice against the oppressive policies that the United States government carries out in different countries like India. The funding that various Christian NGOs and various Christian missionary organizations get in India from the United States government We've never heard uh, Sheldon Pollock ever talk about these things. So again, it is important to understand who these people are. It is important that we Hindus realize what we are up against and we realize who these people are and know more about these people. Whenever these people are invited to India for Jaipur Literary Fest or anything like that, I'm not saying that we go protest and deplatform these people, but I think it is very important that we hit these organizations where it hurts. We spread the word and we just do not go and see these people. If the Jaipur Literary Fest realizes that literally nobody is showing up to watch Sheldon Pollock speak, then they will stop inviting Sheldon Pollock. It is important for us to take these measures because then these people will always keep finding platforms in India. Guys, I hope you liked today's episode. If you liked today's episode, please make sure to give this a thumbs up. It helps the channel out. It helps me out. Please make sure to share this video with as many people as you can. And please make sure to subscribe to the show's channel down below. I also want to ask you if there are any academicians that you would like me to cover as part of this series. If you have any, please let me know on my Twitter right here. And you can also comment in the comment section down below. Thanks very much for watching today's show again, guys. I will see you on Monday. And until then, stay happy, stay healthy, and I'll see you soon.